we'll we'll have this recorded and we'll have this posted on the website in case you you want to go back and review it later yourself or and also for individuals who couldn't be here today so that they have a chance to go back and and review it and so you'll have a chance to hear from people at different stages of the the process um not all of our presenters are here today so we'll adjust as we go uh, but the plan is for you to hear from someone who is at the University Promotion and Tenure uh, Committee level, for you to hear from someone who's at the dean's level, for you to hear from someone who's at the department chair's level, and also for you to have an opportunity to hear from someone who's just recently gone through the process. And uh, it, as, as we can, as a group, we'll try to answer questions or individually try to answer questions for you. Um, I wanted to start at the Academic Affairs website, just in case you haven't taken a look at what's there. Uh, so if you go to the website and you go to faculty resources, um, you'll see promotion and tenure. And I have to watch that. I don't overshoot the screen. And so, of course, the timeline for what we're doing today is, is here, but what's more important than that is the overall timeline. So um, in, in January, January 18, the portfolio is due to department chairs for the department chairs to review. I, I would encourage you to try to beat the clock on that one. I think that that's going to be singularly the, the most important step in this process. And I'll try to speak to that again a little bit later, but we've got uh, department chair representation today. And so I, the, the earlier you can get that to your chair, the better. Um, your chair can, if you can get that to your chair a little early, just as a quick tip, and I don't want to overstep, we've, we've, our speakers will go through some of this as well, but you'll have an opportunity maybe to ask some questions about how you've got it formatted and if you need to make any changes and that sort of thing. So the earlier, the better. Um, next stage, February 4th, uh, the portfolio moves from uh, the chair to in, uh, to a college level committee review process, and uh, and then very quickly it needs to move to the dean for the dean's recommendation. Uh, something that you need to be aware if you're not aware during each stage that the portfolio moves from stage to stage, you should receive notification of what that group's evaluation is. So you'll, you'll know whether they, they approved or, or not. Um, and, and so, and I'm going to show you a form if you haven't found this form yet that needs to be at the front of the portfolio uh, that marks all of this off. And so you see the process as we go through, uh, through the timeline. So I would, I would look at that timeline carefully. The one that's the most important to you because you really don't touch the portfolio again is getting the portfolio until the very, very end. The portfolio comes back to you at the end of the process after, uh, after the portfolio has gone through the full review. But you really don't touch the portfolio again after you give it to your department chair. And so, but this is so that you know when to expect notification of how the portfolio is moving through the process, what the timeline looks like. Um, key relevant policies and... Um, I'm not going to detail those with you right now, but all of those links should be working now. I noticed one wasn't the other day. So you should be able to click on that and be able to pull up that policy statement and review that policy statement. And uh, I'll, I'll go through some, some basics on that, but I'll, I won't worry about detailing any of that uh, today uh, on the front end. And, and, and at the very end, uh, what I'll do is after each presenter has presented, I'm taking notes. And as we have time, I might do a quick wrap up of some additional things I've thought about. And, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for Q and A. So I'll, I'll hit some of that, but at the very end, um, the documents that you need, there, there are two, the flow sheet and the request for promotion and tenure. Um, both of those have to be at the front of the portfolio. So request for promotion and tenure is a simple one page. It basically uh, signifies what you are going up for. So it's real simple and it initiates the process. Uh, this flow sheet is where each body reviews the portfolio, gives their decision, 
and, and it stays in the portfolio, and then it moves on to the next stage. Uh, but you should still receive a, a memo from that individual or from that group uh, stating what the decision was, uh, just so that you're just so that you're notified. Okay, so that's multi-page because it it goes through all of the different individuals, chief academic officer, um, university promotion tenure committee, and uh, I believe the president. Uh, the president's decision, and then the final recommendations move on to IHL. Uh, so that's so that's how the process works. So the that the final decision actually doesn't happen until the summer. Um, but uh, I will say I'm not aware in um, 26 years of any decision that was made by the institution that was not um, backed by IHL. And so um, it, typically, you know. Um, by the end of the process, uh, what, what the decision will be moving into the next year. Uh, so that's, this was, this actually made it a lot easier because typically I'm standing at the front flipping through pages and trying to show things and we're trying to do handouts and all of that. It's all, it's all put together very, very well. And the video, uh, afterwards, again, uh, once this is recorded and posted, it should be posted on this website. So if you want to go back and review anything from the video, uh, someone raised a question you want, you couldn't remember exactly how they responded, or you just want to direct someone to, uh, to the website. So in case they missed today, it should all be here. And, um, at this time, I, uh, I believe we, we're ready to talk about, uh, what the university promotion and tenure committee's process looks like. And I'll step out of the way and let Dr. Dorsey get set up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Like, I know I'm not going to stand in front of all of these professors and nobody says hello back. You know how it is when you step into that classroom. Um, so I just want to share a few things from the um, from the university PNC committee, just a few tips. Uh, some of these are probably things that you will hear again. Um, that's going to point you to certainly some of those things that are very, very important and that are useful um, throughout the process. Um, so I've been on the university committee a couple of years, uh, three years, I think, uh, after a year or two, it all starts, you see so many and you do so many that you, uh, start to lose track. But the, the things that we're going to mention today are things that year after year, um, you see as the things that make it beneficial or helpful for the uh, university committee to go through the portfolios and to be able to make a decision to make a decision. Um, so a couple of things are from the perspective of um, just some things that will be helpful to you as you prepare the portfolio, particularly for those who are early in, uh, in the career here at the W uh, or early in the career at academia. And some of the other things are just things that are helpful to us as we are doing the review or for others who may be reviewing it, for instance, in your college or uh, department. Um, so the first thing is to just keep good records. <clears throat> um, and again, this is um, most beneficial for anyone who is just getting started. Um, and for anyone who, you know, you have a promotion uh, coming up maybe in a few years. Um, so to keep good records, um, I will admit that in the beginning, uh, for the first time, my records were not as well. Um, some of this information I hadn't really heard. Um, I didn't take the advantage probably that very first year of coming to a seminar such as this. Um, so the first time around, my records were not as good. And I found myself doing a lot of scrambling, trying to find things that were needed um, as I got closer to that point. So if you're early on, this is, I think, some of the best advice. Um, I suggest that you collect and, um, and file documentation. I would suggest under the same categories that your portfolio requires. Um, so as you are matriculating from year to year, just as you participate in professional development activities or as you um, publish articles or as you finish projects, that you take documentation and evidence and go ahead and file them in the category of scholarly or professional activities or teaching and also document the year because once you start to organize the portfolio, it will be easy to just grab the materials that you need from the correct uh, category and to place them in the chronological order that would make sense as someone is reviewing the portfolio. 
Um, we list here some things um, that we talked about across the years that are just some of the beyond the obvious things to, to grab. So the, the uh, requirements are going to tell us the various areas. And there are some things that, are, that you know are required. For instance, your annual performance reviews or your uh, course evaluations. But there are some other things that will become supporting documents or evidence that will need to be in the portfolio that you may not think about until the end. So there's a listing of some things here that as you go through the years that you will collect or as you go through the semester, um, or if you're at this point now and it's gonna be January, then as you start to go back and be sure you've got everything, just some of the things to be sure you consider. Some of those that may not be as obvious um, in the very beginning, if you've attended conferences, um, then just some documentation or evidence of conference attendance, whether it's um, sometimes you may not have brought the bulletin or the program back or you may not be able to find it. But if you can find, for instance, approval from your department head or chair or someone that where you were approved to attend the conference. So any evidence of conference attendance, certainly conference presentations. So if you have the program with your name in there and whatever your presentation title is, um, those things are very helpful and very strong evidence. Um, some listing or either documentation of, for instance, the number of advisees, the number of students that you spend time advising. Um, sometimes those things are, are helpful as well. Um, any evidence of community service. Um, a lot of times we have evidence of things that we do here on campus, meetings we attend, but things in the community. So if you're asked to speak um, somewhere in the community or share your expertise at some community event or places where you may even volunteer in your field or in your area or even outside, wherever you're offering service in the community that... Um, We'll talk about in a few minutes bragging on yourself that makes you look good and in turn makes the university look good, has an impact, a positive impact on the university. Then any evidence of those things, thank you letters, emails, particularly from students who are appreciating you for the service that you've given, time you've spent um, advising or assisting them, um, assistance with student research projects. Um, those are good things that you can evidence. Um, so as you're doing those things, sometimes you may not be thinking this is going to be useful my, for my portfolio. So this is just a listing of some of those things that will be beneficial and will speak well of you that you may want to uh, gather as you go through them. Um, I mentioned collecting the the um, collecting and filing committee appointment emails. This is or 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 uh, letters, and this is mainly for your department or your college. If you're on a university committee, for most of them, membership is listed on the website. And so you can always go, down, go there and download that document and highlight those university committees that you may serve on. But there may not be a formal listing or a page that is um, published that lists your committee assignments in your department or in your college. So any evidence that you may have of that, again, whether it's an email um, that is, you know, mentioning a meeting that we have to have, or if it's um, minutes from a committee meeting, particularly where you've been present or where you participated, then those things will uh, serve as documentation and evidence. And also, again, for those uh, who are early on or, after this time, you've got another promotion coming up in the future. Then updating your CV as you as you do different things can be helpful. A lot of times, or I know for me, when the very first time around, I'd done all these other things, and I'm thinking at that point, well, that's not going to be, you know, the CV is not going to be too hard. But then I found myself, okay, I got to add this. Oh, did I remember to add that? I did this last year or year before. So as you do these various things that will be a part of your uh, Vita, to so just tack them on. If it's March, when you do something, just tack it on in March, open that file and add in that, that presentation or add in that publication. And then when it's time for you to use that Vita, everything is already there and it's updated. <clears throat> So certainly organization is crucial. You'll probably hear this over and over for anyone who has to review or has reviewed um, um, the portfolios. Um, so a table of contents, a good table of contents, along with clearly labeled tabs um, are very beneficial. The tabs help the reviewers find the sections of the application that you're discussing in the narrative. 
And so the narrative, as I'll probably mention again in a minute, and the supporting documents or those appendices work hand in hand. And so what happens is as we're reading in the narrative, we're looking for these statements that will lead us to where those supporting documents are. And so those tabs are very helpful and useful in finding those documents that support the claims that you're making in the narrative. So good tabs, uh, clearly labeled tabs are very beneficial. Um, also, while I'm talking about the table of contents and the tabs, be mindful of the size of your, um, of your binder. Some of these things that we don't think are very important, but when it's going through different reviewers' hands, if the binder is not an appropriate size, it's easy, especially the bulkier they are, for those uh, for them to come open, for documents to slip out. And the last thing you want is for something to be omitted or missed just because things got out of whack and we weren't able to really follow the progression or follow um, your guidance of how to understand what's in there. So be mindful of the size of the, um, of choosing an appropriate binder size for the amount of materials that you have. Um, if you can... Avoid plastic sleeves, then that's good, especially for single pages, things of that nature. Um, plastic sleeves are really not necessary, even if it's documents that may be two or three pages or more. Um, I would um, suggest that if you're going to use sleeves, to allow it to be for bulky items. Um, sometimes we have, we've had individuals, for instance, in music, who might have recorded CDs or recorded music, and they want to include copies of that as part of their supporting materials. Then a sleeve is certainly, um, is certainly to be expected. Um, sometimes we'll have individuals who will submit an entire paper or journal article. And in those cases, then it might then a, a sleeve might be appropriate um, for a bulky document to be included. Also, um, make sure there's a method to the madness. Um, so everybody's portfolio would not look the same, would not follow the exact same perspective or guidance through, but make sure that there is a method to what is presented in there, that there is a flow and that there is an explanation of how to understand the way things are put together so that it makes sense to anyone who is having to review. I might even suggest that, for instance, in your areas of service, that you might consider separating the, the materials or the information department, college, university, community, because it's easy for those things, if we just throw them all together, to really miss whether the individual has what service they might or might not have performed in those various areas. So think about the clearest way to get across um, the things that you have accomplished and the impact that you've made. Uh, one simple statement about letters of recommendation is to try to get letters uh, from individuals who can speak to different aspects of your profession um, rather than three letters from people who know all about your teaching. And so everyone talks about your teaching, but are there individuals um, who may can speak to um, the impact that you're making regarding research or regarding service? Have you performed uh, some outstanding service or um, uh, notable service in your field? And if, is there someone who can speak to that, to the impact that you've made and to the value that you bring? Um, so consider letters from individuals who can speak to the different areas. Um, so the importance of the narrative, um, so this is the opportunity for you to brag on you. Um, most of the time we are in situations where we feel like it's not appropriate to brag on ourselves and we wait for others to do that. But this is, um, this is the one time where that's what's expected. Um, no one knows, mo knows more about what you've done, what you've accomplished than you. And we will only know what you share with us. So this is the time to really brag on the things that you've accomplished in all of those areas. Um, <clears throat> so the narrative should be a description of who you are professionally and why you're an asset to the university. That's what we're looking for uh, as we go through that narrative. And then once again, there should be a thread or there should be a... Um, relationship between what's in the narrative and what's in those supporting documents. And as we read through that narrative, it should help us understand um, what's important and where those supporting documents are, how to find them, and how to make sense of what's there. <clears throat> Certainly, um, for those who are applying for promotion, 
then we would say to be sure that you show growth and you show progression. Again, it's something that you're probably going to hear over again. Um, <clears throat> so you want to be able to demonstrate that you're on a uh, trajectory, a career trajectory, that you are progressing, um, that you are improving. So what have you learned and how have you improved over the years? Um, what changes, if any, have you made um, as a result of your course evaluations or your performance evaluations? How have these things improved you or made you better as a professor, or as a researcher, as a scholar? <clears throat> so number six sounds, sounds very vague and very broad if you first look at it. Um, when it says explain everything, but the reason we ask you to explain everything is we want you to consider that most of the people who will review or read your portfolio are people outside of your discipline. Um, even in your college, others will review who are not a part of your specific discipline. And so their level of knowledge and familiarity with the culture and the jargon may be limited. And so it's important that you provide some level of understanding for them. <clears throat> so we ask in those cases to be sure that you write your narrative and that you prepare the portfolio with the majority of your readers in mind. And again, it's people who don't know as much about your field as you do. <clears throat> um, also, when we talk about explaining everything, consider if you have unusual job responsibilities. For example, in some areas, um, in some areas, for instance, in music, because they do individual instruction and things of that nature, their course load, or they may list a number of classes that may seem kind of weird for others of us. And so an understanding of what that means or why this exists or why this is different from what might be considered the norm. In some fields, for instance, in nursing, I understand um, that there's a lot of team teaching. Again, that is something that is not quite the standard across the university, may not be the standard in most of the other areas. So an understanding of what that means and how it translates back to what you provide and the amount of time and effort that is required, even in those courses. Um, also, in those areas, there may be lots of clinicals and other responsibilities that may cause a reduced committee assignment. And so once again, these are good things to explain so that those outside of your field may understand why, there's, there, may, why there may not be as much committee work, for example, as there might be in some other areas. Um, certainly the impacts, um, the impact that you've made or that you're making in your field or in your area, whether it's through your research or through your service, then once again, you want to be sure that you explain these things. As we talk about, um, as you just mentioned, papers that you might have written, um, they may not fully understand, particularly if you discovered something um, or you have tested something or um, brought something to light in your field that we just don't understand how big of a deal it is. So this is the place, once again, to remember to explain to us why this matters. <clears throat> um, again, if there is any distinct uh, distinction in journal articles, for instance, if you've not only published, but maybe you've published in a top journal or a very well-recognized journal in your field, um, if you've received uh, a highly competitive uh, grant or some type of um, uh, distinctive or coveted award, then again, make sure you explain that so we can really understand the relative importance and significance of, of uh, these efforts. Um, and I've already spoken to the jargon and the understanding of terminology. So if there are terms, again, words and definitions that might only be understood in your field or close to your field, then making sure that the reader understands or uh, the definition or of the terminology being used. And uh, finally, to um, address any gaps um, or missing documents. So we know that, as I mentioned earlier, there are some things that the university requires, that when you look at those things, it's gonna, you'll, you'll find words to tell you, be sure you have all of your, uh, and your annual performance evaluations, or make sure you've included all of your course evaluations. So if any of these documents or any supporting documents for things that you are laying claim, then that if any of these documents are missing, it's important to explain why they are missing. If there are gaps, years where you might ha not have accomplished something or done something, then an explanation um, would certainly be beneficial to those who are uh, performing an evaluation. For those things that are required, we would suggest that maybe you would ask your dean or your chair 
to provide a letter um, explaining why those things were permitted to be omitted or why they are missing. Uh, one of the years that um, that I went before uh, the promotion and tenure committee, I did not have a um, performance evaluation for I think it was just one year. But during that time, um, we had a dean who simply did not give us the performance evaluation at the end. We had the meeting, we had the conversations, but we never received the document at the end as evidence of that. And so thankfully, I had a chair who was able to speak to that and provide a letter explaining um, why this particular document was not only admitted, but is considered acceptable that it was omitted. Um, I think those are the things that um, that we've come across and that we've discussed in University PNC that are both beneficial, I think, to you and as well as to other reviewers across campus. Thank you. Hello, I'm Maria Scott, and I'm the chair of the BSN program, and I will be talking to you um, about promotion and tender. <clears throat> from the uh, perspective of the department chair. <clears throat> so some of this will uh, be a repeat of um, what Dr. Dorsey has already presented, but I think it'll be good to hear it um, maybe um, in a different, different light. Um, each year, of course, you know, we do annual evaluations. Your department chair will meet with you to do your annual. You know, at that time, that's really when we're looking at those three main areas um, that you will be um, doing and promoting and showing uh, how you're meeting those areas for your um, promotion. So that's really when we see what you have accomplished um, that past year. And then we can also talk to you at that time about expectations. What are some expectations if you're planning to go up for promotion and or tenure, you know, what do you need to work on? Maybe if there's areas that you need to bone up on a little bit or improve on, um, or if you're doing good in all three areas, maybe it's just that you continue to maintain those three areas, you know, while you're waiting to go up um, for promotion. Um, and then also, uh, like Dr. Dorsey said, I do think it's important to say, you know, that, that each academic portfolio is not going to fit necessarily a predefined mold, you know, because a lot of it is going to be based on your academic area. So that's really when that um, narrative that you will write up for each area is really that's when it becomes real important um, because the person reviewing it, you know, for me, I'm nursing. So if I look at a portfolio that someone from nursing has done, I'm going to know the lingo and I'm going to know the language. But if someone from a different area um, is the one reviewing your portfolio, they're not going to know what that means. OK, so just be cognizant of that. And, uh, and it, you know, it may seem elementary to you to have to explain it um, in detail that way, but it's really better for those that will be reviewing um, your document. <clears throat> Um, I do want to mention, um, and uh, Dr. Hatton had already talked about this, and he actually showed you the website, but you do have uh, resources that are available to you um, as faculty that you can go in and look at. So if you have not been um, to the website and looked at these as you prepare to um, get ready to start getting your step together for promotion and or tenure, I would encourage you to go in and for sure read all three policies um, because just in, as a review for myself, just for today, I went back and reviewed them. So as department chair, when a portfolio is turned into me, that's really my responsibility is I need to make sure that we are meeting those policies. It does this portfolio have what it needs to have in order to meet approval to go forward. Otherwise, you know, I'm not doing you a disservice as a chair um, if I send it on and it's incomplete and we have not utilized our policy and met our policy. OK, so I do encourage you to look at that. 1302 is just that standard policy related to your initial appointment. 1303 is for those that are going up for promotion. 1304 is for um, those that are going up for tenure. So I do encourage you to go in and look at those. Um, also, um, as Dr. Hatton showed you earlier, the promotion and tenure documents, those first two documents are listed there on the website, your flow sheet, which is required um, at the beginning of your portfolio. 
and also that request for promotion and or tenure um, form is also required. So be sure and print those off. Those will be placed at uh, the front of your portfolio. Okay. Um, I did want to just point out as a department chair, my responsibility is making sure that really that you meet the minimum requirements before we go through and look you know, at your teaching and your service and your scholarship, do you meet the minimum requirements? And those are actually listed in your um, policy statement 1303. So I just listed those there for you. Instructor, that initial instructor position, master's degree, potential for teaching. Assistant professor, 30 hours postgraduate work or credit, and they have to have the evidence to show or to meet those three areas. Associate, have to have a terminal degrees, minimum of five years teaching experience, and then also the evidence to support all three areas. Professor, terminal degree, minimum of six years, along with your evidence. So as part of my role, that's what I'm going to do first, is check to see that you meet minimum requirements. Do you have the terminal degree if you're going up for associate professor? Do you have the minimum five years teaching experience? And then, then I will go forward to see if you have evidence to support all three areas. <clears throat> okay, and then the next things that are listed, a lot of it piggybacks off what uh, Dr. Dorsey has already talked about, but I do want to just review some of that with you again um, as we go through. <clears throat> um, the process, of course, we talked about already the request for promotion and or tenure form, your flow sheet, it's going to have just your basic information on it along with your current rank. Um, and then, of course, the flow sheet will be first completed by, your, by the department chair. Okay, so once I have reviewed the portfolio, then I'm going to indicate whether or not it's favorable um, or unfavorable uh, to move forward um, and, and have to recommend by letter if, if we're moving forward to the next step, which would be our college um, committee for promotion and tenure. Um, letters of recommendation, you are required to have three to five. Um, I would say at least a minimum of three. You do need one for each area um, of importance. So you do need someone that can do a letter for you related to your teaching learning, okay? Another that can speak to scholarly and another that can speak to your service, okay? So, and if you have, you know, five would typically be the maximum that you would have, but at least have those minimum three, one for each area. Of course, your annual evaluations are in there. Your uh, curriculum beta updated is in there. Student evaluations um, are in there. It says, according to our policy, numerical um, evaluation is required, and that's what currently we utilize here at the W. You do not necessarily have to have um, evaluations in there where the student has actually wrote comments. That's totally optional, but if you choose to put that in there, that's fine. Um, peer evaluations are listed on the policy as being optional as well. And then, of course, that's where you talk of, uh, then listed the documentation for your teaching service and your scholarship. And then just to piggyback off of uh, Dr. Dorsey, what uh, she's already spoke on, I just listed some areas that we typically see. Um, some of these may be more uh, geared toward nursing, but a lot of them are just going to be general teaching things that you'll see done. Um, so teaching effectiveness, um, explain everything. Um, you know, when you do your narrative, be sure and explain everything that you're going to be showing in your artifacts or in your evidence, okay? That way, when they read the narrative, they know what to expect. So when they flip through and see the documents, they know what it is. Um, if you've developed a new course, if you have revised a course, um, any type of admission, retention efforts, anything like that. Um, for, for nursing, you know, we have our big ASAP retention plan that we do. So that for sure should be in yours. And I know other departments and areas, you have specific efforts that you do for your students. Anything like that, that you, if it's a form, um, you can put a copy of that in there, anything like that uh, to show what you're doing. Um, a simulation activity, maybe if you wrote a simulation. Um, and it doesn't, and this is something that's hard for me because I'm, I tend to be a little type A, but it doesn't have to be typed 
and pretty and perfect. It can be just be a document that you've worked on and made notes on or that you're working on or whatever. You can actually put that in there to show that that's something you're doing. That's hard for me to do to put some, something out there that, that doesn't necessarily look neat or look perfect. Um, but you don't have to do that. Um, it's just showing that evidence of these are the things that you're working on or that you're trying to improve on. Um, any awards or honors, um, particularly if you've received anything uh, related to excellence uh, in teaching, anything like that would go there. Um, copies of your syllabi can go there, um, especially if you've had revisions to your courses. That kind of goes along with the one we've already mentioned. You know, if you do a handout, any of your lectures that you do online, if you've created a rubric, you know, it can just be any number of things that you can use for evidence. And uh, a lot of that's going to depend on your field. <clears throat> Scholarly and professional activities, um, evidence, course research. Um, and that may look a little different depending on your department. OK, um, writing, if you've done any type of scholarly writing. Any performance or performing other creative works that are done, if you've uh, been published, any kind of publication, if you've presented papers, if you've presented orally at a conference, if you've presented posters, any of that would count. Um, professional and scholarly services, involvement in professional organizations. So if, if you are members, if you um, serve as officers, if you do anything for those organizations, this is where you would want to put that information. Um, and then grant activity also um, is listed. <clears throat> also, another thing that's not on this list, but if you serve as a mentor, and I know we have an established mentoring program in nursing, so if you serve as a faculty mentor um, for a new faculty, anything like that would be considered um, in this area. So that's something else to think about as well. <clears throat> and then the last category is service to the university and the community. Of course, this is where you're going to list your com uh, committee work, whether it's on the department level, college level, university level, any type of administrative duties you might have, involvement with student activities, anything on campus, basically campus life, just think campus life, um, and then community service. So just to kind of close out my area, the biggest thing for me for department chair is it's really probably going to be the ongoing yearly, um, you know, annual evaluations and then just meeting with faculty throughout the year um, that are either considering going up for promotion or that know that maybe they're going up the next year. But, but really looking at um, what they have accomplished, what they need to maybe uh, like I said, bone up on or improve on, spound on, whatever, to improve certain areas so that we make sure um, that we're covering everything. Once it comes to me and I check everything and I make sure that we're following the policy, then hopefully it'll be a favorable outcome and we can send that forward. Um, I do want to say, just like Dr. Hatton mentioned earlier, I know for me personally, I think I've got about 10 uh, individuals going up for promotion. So I'm going to have a lot that I have to look at as department chair. So anybody that can get it in earlier than January the 19th, because that, that's kind of a short two weeks to try to get those turned around, especially if it's one that we need to look at and maybe have you make some changes to or add to or whatever. Hi, I'm Carmen Osborne. I'm a newly promoted professor of music. And so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, faculty's perspective. So my best advice, really, after going through this last year, is just to be prepared. Keep all of your documents. Be an organized pack rat. Um, keep everything that you might even think would apply years down the road, especially through the beginning of this process. Uh, keep emails. Keep anything that comes across your desk. Um, letters of request for you to participate in, in committees and different things. It, either organize them in a file folder, uh, a paper file folder, which works for me, or a digital folder. Do what works for you. 
organize it in a way that makes sense to you so that you can then go back and find all of your documents later on. Uh, of course, I'm going to repeat a lot of what's already been said. So save those student evaluations. Um, you know, we, we get them through Canvas now, but um, there was a time when we were going back and forth or back from Blackboard to Canvas and we had to save them or they would be lost. So make sure that if you have things that need to be saved from previous uh, ways of student evaluations that you have those and find those. And if not, if you haven't saved them from, from that transition, um, talk to your department chair because they are also copied, I believe, on all of those student evaluations. So maybe they have it in a, in a hard copy or saved somewhere. And that saved me actually my first round through uh, promotion and tenure. Um, I was new to academia and had come to uh, the W from a, a clinical position as a music therapist. So I really was not familiar with the tenure and promotion process. Um, and so I was a little late getting to some of the um, workshops. Uh, so I hadn't saved a lot of information from those first couple of years of teaching. Um, so uh, when, I, when it came time to put my first portfolio together, I didn't have a lot of those uh, student evaluations because I didn't realize how important they were. So I went to my department chair at the time and, and he was able to come up with a few of them. Uh, also be aware that um, courses that don't meet a minimum requirement of students don't get evaluated. And, and I had to explain that in, a, in my portfolio because a lot of my classes have less than five students in them. And I think now the cutoff is three, but I'm not really sure about that. Um, but anyway, um, a lot of my classes weren't evaluated. So in my um, narrative, I had to explain why that documentation wasn't there and why in some semesters, none of my classes were evaluated by students. Um, so as long as you explain those kinds of things, that, that's good. Um, also in your evaluation, your student evaluations, in your narrative, Refer to them. Talk about, you know, how you have made changes in your coursework, in your syllabi, in your uh, handouts and things for your, for your classes based on students' comments. Um, you know, we all know that sometimes students make comments that are unreasonable or suggestions, but often, you know, we really can learn from them. So if you have made changes based on what students have suggested or complained about, then um, talk about that in your narrative and explain how that has helped you grow as a professor. Um, I also mentioned, you know, saving some student documents, um, artwork, papers, anything that demonstrates some of their outstanding work that you have coached, maybe even examples of a rough draft that you've made comments on, and then the, the final version of a paper or a presentation that they've done uh, to show that your instruction has helped them grow. Um, be bold. Again, don't be afraid to brag on yourself. This is the time not to be shy and not to be um, unaware of even your own um, achievements. Put them out there. Uh, talk about everything that you have achieved. Um, Again, ask for letters of reference that uh, apply to specific parts or specific areas of your work. Um, don't forget, though, that you shouldn't ask for, for, for your uh, letters of reference to come from your department chair or the dean, because they're going to be seeing your portfolio and writing a letter already. So the three or to five letters need to come from other, other people, um, faculty members in your department, outside your department. Uh, other people, even in the community and other areas of uh, even colleagues from other universities who may be able to speak about your work. Um, also in the in the narrative, I find it's I have found it's really important to, to write about your passion, whether your passion is for research that involves students or your own research or teaching or student projects that you in, get the, the, the students involved in. Um, Talk about how meaningful it is for you to be involved in those endeavors. Um, and also, again, describe ways that you've grown as an educator over, over your time period at, at, at MUW. And, you know, you may even might want to reference things that happened even before you got here. Like I said, I was a, a clinician primarily and had been doing some part-time teaching at a, at a different university. But when I came here, it was my first full-time teaching job. And so I grew, I feel like tremendously 
in those first couple of years, just learning how to be a full-time professor, how to uh, organize syllabi and course uh, uh, rubrics and things like that. I didn't really even know what a rubric was before I got here. So that was a big learning curve for me too. Um, and then also I think, especially when you're um, applying for, for the tenure and promotion is to tell your vision of your future at the W. What do you see that you can um, give to the university community in the future? What, what kind of ideas do you have for, for expanding your role, uh, increasing um, courses that you might want to in the future um, teach? Uh, you just your vision for what you want to continue to work on as, as a professor. Now, this list um, of don't wait is, I was looking at it and thinking, these are things that I would tell students. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Start collecting your items now. Uh, keep, like I said, be organized with it. The more you can be organized, the easier it will be when it comes to that time to put all of the documents together. Give yourself plenty of time to write your narrative. Don't rush that because it's going to be a significant document um, depending on what you're, you know, how involved you're going to be writing. And we want to, to write as much as we can, like she said, so that the other professors who aren't in our field will, will understand and know what we're doing. So give yourself plenty of time to write that and then go back and proofread and proofread again and maybe get someone else to read it and proofread it. I put my portfolio out the other day and was kind of flipping through it to kind of remind myself of the process. And I found a typo. I was like, oh, so and I hadn't had someone else read it. So, you know, it's, it won't hurt to send it through some other eyes besides yours. Um, use your yearly evaluations as the base of your portfolio. Um, in my first round uh, from uh, promotion and tenure, um, my um, department chair at the time did very informal evaluations and um, didn't really require that we submit information to, to him about what we had done over the course of the year. It was just an informal meeting. Um, in the second round, uh, our um, department chair requires almost a portfolio to be submitted every year for our, um, our, our um, department chair evaluations, which I find has been very helpful in this last round of promotion um, portfolio. So I just took those documents, kind of transferred them over, cut and pasted as I need to, added things in, and it was a much easier process than having to kind of start from scratch. Um, and I don't know how other departments do that, but those were my ex time, two opposite experiences of, of um, department chair evaluations. Um, set deadlines for yourself. You know your best way of being organized. Um, I work very well with deadlines and I have to put them on my calendar ahead of time, a week ahead of time and when it's due so that I keep myself organized. Um, I don't do well with saying, oh, well, I'm going to do this next week or I'm going I'm to do it by the end of the month. I have to really put things on my calendar and stick to them. So if that's the way that you work, do that. Keep yourself and give yourself deadlines. Not, you know, don't wait till December after classes are over to try to put your portfolio together when it's going to be due the 1st of January because you will be scrambling and nervous and you won't be able to enjoy your holiday. So um, start now. If you're um, applying for January, start now if you haven't already. Um, and then like I said, put, begin putting it together. And I mean by compiling all the documents and putting it in the, in the binders at least a month ahead of time before the due date so that you can Go back and revise it as you need to. Uh, make sure that you have multiple opportunities to include everything that you want to include. Um, also, I, I think a lot of my knowledge for the second round of, of being promoted professor was influenced by the opportunity that I had to serve on a college uh, promotion and tenure committee. And that really was helpful in, in me seeing other people's uh, portfolios. So then I could plan better for my second portfolio for promotion to professor. So if you get the opportunity to, for that, do take advantage of it. You'll learn a lot just from being on that committee. Um, something that I also um, think is important is don't put your, all of your stuff into one big, giant, huge binder. Because like they said, they're going to be passed around from person to person and a binder that weighs 10 pounds is going to be difficult to maintain. 
So maybe in one, a smaller binder, you have your narrative, your uh, student evaluations, your faculty evaluations, and in a, uh, another binder, which may be larger, you have all of your documents, your evidence that you're going to be pointing to from your narrative. So two smaller binders is much better and manageable for you and for everyone else than one giant, huge binder. Um, other tips, these were things that at the end, uh, I was just kind of brainstorming things that I might have wanted to hear as, as someone who's applying. Um, review your emails uh, for documents and other correspondence that you may have. Um, often, I, if I remember and I get an email that I need, feel like I need to put or keep for my portfolio, I'll print it off right then and stick it in my file. But I miss a lot of those. So go back. You know, scroll back through all of your emails for the past few years if you've got them saved that way and um, and print off the ones that you need because you might have forgotten of something or um, save them into a different uh, folder in your emails um, instead of having to print them off one at a time. Um, don't be afraid to include pictures or recordings or really any example of your scholar scholarly work. Um, I'm not sure that. Uh, a lot of it will get listened to, the CDs, although they may, but at least having the evidence of them is there. Pictures are, are great as well for things that might not fit in a binder. Um, clippings from newspaper, anything that you can use as evidence would be great. Um, this has already been mentioned, but organize it well using uh, good visuals for the people who will be reading them to, um, to follow along with your documentation. And again, don't wait till the last minute. I think that's the biggest piece of advice. Uh, that I didn't necessarily follow. Um, I had everything done and then realized the day before it was due that I hadn't included a few documents and I needed to run to the printer. And I was jockeying at the printer with another faculty member who was printing off portfolio stuff too. And uh, put it all in the last minute, had to revise a couple of things. And then the day it was due, I got it turned in on time. But because I had waited a little bit too long, it made more stress for me and, um, and more stress for the other faculty member who was kind of in the same position. We're trying to fight for the copy machine. Um, so again, just find the organization track that works for you and stick with it. Remind yourself, give yourself deadlines, um, collect everything. And then once you've got everything together, organize in a way that makes sense to you, but also that can be communicated to whoever may be reading it. Hello, I'm Brian Anderson, the Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Education, and I just want to say a couple of things about the Dean's role in this process. Um, you know, the Dean works very closely with department chairs. Uh, we don't work as closely with, say, mainline faculty members that we, of course, want to know them as best we can. Uh, but as far as knowing their professional work, their teaching, their service commitments, we take cues from the chairs. And it's mainly through those annual evaluations. Uh, that's usually the first thing I go for in reviewing a PNT file. Um, but I'm also looking for certain cues that make me then go to other materials in the binders uh, because a well-written annual evaluation uh, response to the faculty member will indicate why that person has strengths or, or what are the particular things they need improvement on in the areas of interest. Uh, and I can follow along to see if there's evolution over the years, to see if the faculty member has addressed it, uh, largely by looking to see how the chair has responded to the encouragement or the uh, uh, recommendation to make changes. Uh, looking for the things that the other pre presenters have said, a reflective teaching method, uh, a sense of, of you know, direction as a professional and a desire to grow as a professional, uh, but also contributing uh, to the life of the campus, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, not very exciting committee work, uh, but nevertheless, the opportunities also to represent the W off campus or otherwise promote the university as best you can. Uh, but I'm doing this mainly through those annual evaluations. Now, there are some chairs who will write very brief ones. And you might say, or a professor might say, wow, I handed in a nice narrative for the, say, 2018 year, talking about some uh, you know, reflective method and changes I've made as a teacher. And I get two sentences back, say, great job. 
I really like what you did with X. And like, I had eight paragraphs on this or, you know, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm going to look at that as, well, that's a problem with the chair rather than the uh, a faculty member. Uh, but you should be aware of that if that's you. Uh, if your chair is giving you sort of two sentence responses, or in some cases, no annual evaluation at all, that does happen. Uh, as was said before, you have to account for that. You have to get some documentation to say, this is why this didn't happen. Uh, but in your narrative, in your PNT binder, you need to sort of make up for that. Um, now you, you don't need the tattle on your chair, but you need to sort of indicate that you're aware of this. Um, that 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 you, you didn't get the full kind of guidance uh, or encouragement or um, analysis of your work that you should have, uh, but that is very much a um, an exception. Uh, the vast majority of chairs on this campus do a very good job of of really getting into your work and and trying to understand you because uh, really you all know by now that uh, resources are limited on this campus and the best thing we can do is have faculty members who are encouraged and energized to make the most of what we have. Uh, and that's a real strength. Uh, but in those cases where there are gaps, uh, I highly recommend that you try to fill it. Now, here's another, hate to just be talking about bad things in this relationship with the chair, but another thing that I'm looking for uh, is, is the possibility that there may not be a good relationship between faculty member and chair. Uh, and if there's critique or, or something that sort of builds up and a resistance from the faculty member, no, you don't understand, I need to do it this way. And the chair says, no, you need to do it this other way. And there's some sort of impasse that that, that can happen. Uh, and I'm not here to, to cast blame on anybody, but I want to see it addressed, preferably year to year. Um, if there's something that really is an impasse between faculty member and the chair, and it shows up in the annual evaluation, especially if it uh, influences whether or not you get a good versus what's just below good, like satisfactory or something like that. And, you, and, and a faculty member says, no, that is unfair. You're allowed to write a response to that, to have included in your annual evaluation materials. Um, I'm not interested as dean in seeing a full out argument, but I would like to know that if there really is a reason why the faculty member disagrees with what might seem a serious concern about that faculty member's work as a teacher or researcher or whatever, um, you know, defend yourself if it has to come to that. And, and I have had to give that advice on occasion, but it's very rare. But I, I want this to be known now, even for those of you who are brand new to the W, uh, because this is the first thing I look at in a file. And, and, and I love the narratives and I love all the um, uh, pieces of evidence that Carmen mentioned. Um, and, and sometimes I will leaf through and, and I like to see those CDs and things in there like, oh, you know, I don't have time to look through all this, but it's great to see the very colorful uh, development of a, of a faculty colleague on, on, on campus. Um, uh, but when it comes down to it, I, I'm, I'm gonna follow the chair's cue. And if everything looks good, I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, but if there, if there are disconnects and, and red flags in this chair-faculty relationship, I'm gonna dig deeper. And, and if there's any concern on your end, you need to help me understand uh, what might've been happening from your perspective, uh, because I, I'm not supposed to go to the faculty member or the chair after I have the binder and say, tell me more about this and let's add another document. I, I can't do that. Uh, so I, I wanted to cover those worst case scenarios just in case and small chance that it might actually happen. Um, other than that, any advice I could give would just repeat what others have said. Uh, but let me go back to that point I made about resources on campus. Um, you know, a school like this one, uh, we make the best of what we have. And I do read those uh, faculty member narratives for the PNT file. And any honesty you have about, okay, you know, I got this grant, that's wonderful. Tell me all about it. But how about, uh, well, 
you know, my, my funding for this particular aspect or the department's aspect of this operation got slashed or otherwise had to be shared with something else. And here's how I made do. Um, that's the state we're in now. Um, and so anything, you, you know, if, you, if, if it comes to showing how you made the best out of a difficult situation, it'd be greatly appreciated rather than just saying, well, I didn't get exactly what I wanted, so I didn't do anything. <laughs> that's yeah, not as helpful. Um, so I think that's all I really had to offer. Yeah, okay. So, so I've made a few notes and uh, I, always, I always do with these. And one of the things that, that, you, that you got from this, I hope, uh, was a lot of redundancy. And that's, that's what you got. And, and actually, I always want that to happen. And the reason why is you need to know that this portfolio review process is not a moving target, that everybody's reviewing your portfolio the, the same way. And you should expect a good and fair review process all the way through. Um, really, everyone should be looking at the same thing. But, but what you're getting is the perspective of people from different areas of campus looking at it. And, and that's, that's absolutely critical. And so um, I, I, always, I always say, you know, forgive us for the redundancy, but I'm glad you got it. That's, that's absolutely critical that, that you know what, what this process looks like. Um, some of the, I, I may repeat a few things, but um, I, I, I always I always take notes and think about things in, in the process that I went through. And then I've served as a chair, as an interim dean. I've, I've served in a, in a lot of different roles. So I've, I've seen it from a lot of different ways too. Um, one of the things that you heard is it might not be a bad idea to use more than one binder. Uh, what, what, what I did, I'm not saying this is necessarily the right way to do it, but this is what, what you were hearing. What I did is put the primary documents in a smaller binder, and then I referenced the, the documents in a larger binder. That way, someone could, could go through this, and if they did not care to look at all that, they didn't have to. If they had a question, they could go, well, let me flip that open, and I can look at that. And it makes it easier for the user as opposed to trying to put everything in one binder where, okay, the key documents here, the narratives here, and it's referencing something else later in the, in the binder, and they're, they're tearing the binder up, flipping back and forth. And I know that may sound um, real, real basic. And some of the suggestions I might make are real basic, but I still think they, they might be helpful. Um, you heard that it might be a good idea to consider more than uh, one person as a uh, reference. Um, there was uh, an instance where I thought it was really important that I used five references. Now, for me, I always my strategy always was, uh, as you heard, have a reference from someone on campus, typically, who can speak to the major areas. Um, and you do have to have minimum three references. That's, that is required by policy. You may have five. Um, in one instance, I, I brought in two people from outside. And the reason why I did that is one person uh, is, is Dr. Pat Dunat, who's now, at the time, she was a, a vice president at another university when I referenced her. Now she's actually a, a SACS VP, and I continue to work with Pat ever since she was here. But she was also um, the uh, associate vice president for academic affairs, and I did a lot of committee work with, with Dr. Dunat. And so I got a letter from, from Pat that referenced some of the committee work that I did with her. Um, and then I also got a letter. I, my area of specialty is media effects. And at the time that I went through the PNT and with this portfolio, I was the only media effects person on campus. It's not an area that a lot of people know a whole lot about. And so I was actually working with, uh, um, after I'd finished the, uh, my, my coursework with this individual, I was still working with someone uh, at the University of Alabama where I studied, Dr. David Roskesey Woolson. And uh, I was, I was a, a journal reviewer for uh, Media Psych while he was one of the editors. And he and I saw, uh, I, we were also working on a research project together. And so I thought it was really important that I had a reference from, from uh, Dr. Roskesey Woolson because he could speak to the the value or not of my work as a media effects scholar and really nobody else on campus had any reference point for that so i thought it was really important to do that um you've heard a lot about organization a, a strategy i came up with was when i went into a section i also 
uh, sometimes created like a mini index or a mini narrative. So for, for my references, I, I put why there are my references in there. And so I give a little explanation. These are the letters in this order, and this is why these letters are in here. And so I was hopeful, especially with Dave, I didn't know if someone would understand why I went with Dr. Roscoe C. Woodson off campus for this. So I needed to make it clear why I put him in as a reference. Um, that that to me was that to me was kind of kind of a helpful thing. Um, I've mentioned that uh, I don't do as much of this now as I used to, but I've reviewed uh, a lot as I've been a blind peer reviewer a lot for di for different journals. And you might wonder, well, where do you put something like that? Does that go in service or does that go in scholarship? And I would suggest that you have a conversation with your department chair about how you place some things. If I felt like I was a, a little light on service and a little heavy on scholarship and my chair was okay with it, I might put that in service. And if I thought I was a little light on scholarship and a little heavy on service, I might put that in scholarship because for me to be a, uh, and, and some of you do this as well, I, I have to be on top of the field. I have to do some research. Sometimes I'm, I'm kind of sort of in that ballpark, but not exactly. I'm going to have to do a lot of research in order to be able to explain, yep, their work does make sense and here's why, or here's the reason why I have some concerns about this particular article. And so there are some things that might fit in more than one place. And so I would be strategic about it as much as I could, but I would also kind of talk with my chair about that. And this has been talked about a lot, and I'm going to stress this again. The the you know, think about think about how an argument works in law. This is status quo, right? The first argument is the most important argument. The department chair knows your work better than anybody else. And uh, even if the department chair doesn't work in your specific area of specialty, the department chair knows your work better than anyone else and also knows what you've been asked to do in the department. That letter, that evaluation is the most important evaluation in the process because everyone else is going to be working get against that evaluation. So as Dr. Anderson pointed out, the, the, the dean's going to take a look because the dean knows that because the dean doesn't have as much direct interaction with you as um, as the department chair does, um, and and certainly the P and T committee, there may be someone on the committee who's a colleague of yours, but you have to assume you don't have someone there who really deeply understands what you do. And so um, I also kind of liken this to uh, preparing for an, for accreditation. I tend to think a lot about accreditation. I've been involved in that a lot. And so you're going to have people in an accreditation site visit who don't know anything about your campus and all of that. And you know how careful we have to be explain everything. Kind of sort of treat it like that, too, because the people who are on that P&T committee, even at the college level, frankly, but especially at the university level, um, may not understand all the specifics about what you do. And so that's that's important. Um, we talked a little bit about eva um, student evaluations. Uh, I do, and, and, and you've heard both, you don't, it's not required that you have the written narrative. I, I would encourage you to consider using those though, because it is a good opportunity for you to show how you uh, made improvements in your instruction and in your advising. Um, the, the, the key three components, and, and I know everyone knows what they are, but it's, it's teaching and advising, it's scholarly or creative work, and it's service. And you have a lot of room for defining some things because there's, there's some variance, especially when you get into scholarly and creative. Um, and we need to probably step back into that one for just a moment. But you have, you have some room for variance in defining all of those things. What if you were hired into the university as a 404 teaching load, but in year two, you were given an administrative reassignment? And so suddenly your teaching looks a little different. Your service looks a little different. Don't assume that the committee is going to understand what just happened. You need to, you need to explain those sorts of things in your narrative. And, uh, and probably your evaluation with your department chair helps to back that up. Sometimes it doesn't. Dr. Anderson spoke to that. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's not as explanatory. Sometimes what your goals for this next year were not clearly laid out. Um, as, as well as, as uh, you might like for, for an external reviewer to have a look and see how that, oh, my work just changed. I was just given a release from, um, 
service because I'm going back to finish up this semester my, my doctoral work. And so I'm going to look heavy on scholarship, and my service just dropped off the radar. That was actually planned. It was discussed with the chair. It was a goal for me to do this, to finish this up. So, you know, think about those, those kind of nuances that for you, um, and, and, and this was mentioned too, being careful that you explain everything. I know what NCA is. Probably nobody else in the room does. That's the National Communication Association. I live and breathe and talk that every day. Nobody else does. And so uh, acronyms and those kinds of things, all of those little kinds of things. And, and, and you, ha you had it mentioned that might be a good idea to have another set of eyes look at your portfolio. I might even encourage that it be someone either completely outside your discipline or maybe even someone completely off this campus who doesn't even understand academia. And if they can follow through your explanation of what was going on there, then, then surely your colleagues on, on campus should be able to do that. Um, on scholarly work, you might want to not assume that the, the reader knows what you do and why that has value in your discipline, you probably want to explain that to them. Um, maybe, maybe for in your discipline, there's an expectation that it's published and parish kind of thing. And even though we're not a publisher parish institution, that that you work toward that kind of thing, and that's the real key goal. But that's not going to be the same thing for every discipline. And that and and in the scholarly creative area is the one area where uh, you can see tremendous variance. And even within a department, you might have sub-disciplines that have very different kinds of expectations. Um, so those are, those are just some of the things that uh, I, I took more notes than that, but those are some of the things that kind of stood out to me. Uh, to just reinforce things that were said and, uh, and also to um, um, maybe add a little bit here and there as we go. And I think at this point, what we would like to do is open it up for, uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes. And, and I'm willing to stay if any of you still have questions after the, uh, the two o'clock hour. Uh, but certainly, we, we're, we're clearly blocked until two. Um, if, you, if you have a question, what we're going to do is I'm, we're going to repeat it so that it's picked up um, for the recording. And, uh, and, and I don't think I'm going to answer every question or be able to answer every question. So might, might have to ask my colleagues to help me out a little bit as we go. Uh, so do we, do we have any questions at this point about the process or uh, really, you know, I mean, we can get as specific as you want and we can try to answer it for you. Yes. So, so the question is for the for the for the for the process for promotion. Do you do you continue to build on one binder from the previous promotion cycle, or, or do you just um, do you start new with a with a new binder? I, I started new, and so I, th I think that's the the general expectation that you don't you don't necessarily continue to build. Uh, I would I will say this, and I, and I do need to mention this too. If you're bringing in uh, years or work from another institution, um, you you do want to bring that into, especially for the tenure process. And uh, and as you know, it's stated in the policy statement. You don't you don't have to promote. You have to secure tenure. Year six, that's non-negotiable, with this one exception. If you did negotiate. And that can happen on your initial contract as you're initially hired in a couple of years toward uh, tenure and uh, and or promotion. You could negotiate a promotion. Um, that's fine. But I want to I want to state state something, and I want everyone to be really careful about this because I've actually advised someone not to do this. Um, just please know that you can't back up from that. You can't say, okay, so in four more years, I'm going up for tenure. Okay, well, that's, that's great. That's in your contract. That's what you're coming in with, and you're bringing in two years. You can't get to year four and say, I changed my mind. I'm not ready. That's, that's your year. 
So I think that's really, really important. Um, um, of course, we're, we're, we're all here, right? But if you are, if, if for some reason there's, there's something that happens, let's say that you were to leave the W, you went someplace else, you came back again, and there's some sort of ne negotiation on, on years, um, just, just know that that's, that's firm. That's, that's a firm deadline, just as everyone else has the firm deadline on six years. Uh, any, any other, that's a good question. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, and and so the question is, if you've got something that um, that's electronic based and it's not easy to print out and put in a binder, um, and some of the things that I've seen, and I'm going to get my colleagues to help me with this, and I've and actually, and so. My background is actually communication, and I know we've talked about art and music and, and some different things, and so sometimes stuff just doesn't fit into a binder. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're encouraging students to do is to create electronic portfolios. And so you might have a portfolio. What, I, what I've encouraged a communication faculty member to do one time that had a lot of video work, uh, was to have that uploaded into a resource, something like YouTube or something along those lines, that they could have uh, the links referenced in to the online work. And so they basically had um, a, a combination of print and electronic portfolio when for the evidence, for the purpose of the evidence. Do we have anything else? Any other suggestions? So, so it could also be burned to like a USB or a disc or something like that, especially if it's got an active link. And so then you could drop that in and you can click that and pull that up. Okay. And you see, you see that sometimes with accreditation documents too. Right. That's that's a good suggestion. So the suggestion is print screen. If it's something fairly simple, print screen is good. And uh, and I might encourage you to even if you do have links to back up some of that with print screen because sometimes websites change. If it were your website, that's one thing. If you're re referencing someone else's website, you, you don't know that it's always going to be there. And so um, at least being able to capture some of that. I, I've got another suggestion for you as, as well um, that just came to mind while we're talking about documenting. Um, you, you, do, you want to document everything, but you can't over document. And so you don't have to have, like, if you want to put some thank you cards in there from some students who want to speak to your advising and mentorship, that's fantastic, but you don't have to have 50 of them. So, you know, think, think about, but on the other side, if you served on a, uh, if you've been serving on a committee for 10 years, and while you've been serving on that committee, you've been an officer and you've done some different things. It's, it's one thing to say, and I know we tell our students to do this, but sometimes we forget to do this. It's one thing to say, sure, I've been with uh, the National Association of um, whatever for the past 10 years and just list those years. But I would probably bullet point specific things that I've done with that organization. Um, you, you and I both know it's one thing to be someone who just shows up to the meetings. It's another thing to actually do stuff. And so don't assume that the, the person who's reviewing your portfolio is going to understand that you've been working significantly with that organization for a number of years. And I would also say, uh, if you put a document in, let's say that you put something in like, um, let's say that you, you went to conference and you presented, I might be tempted to even photocopy some of the pages from the program that shows you know, that you did actually present this paper 
um, or or the or the eight papers that you presented. I mean, I think that that's helpful. If you have some uh, document that you built for some program, let's say that you, that you were involved in organizing some program, but you not only organized the program, you helped raise money for the program, you did the layout for the marketing for the program. I mean, so if you just put if you just put a, a flyer in there and, and and some quick reference to that program. The, the, the person's reviewing that is not going to understand the depth of what you did. You know, again, you didn't just show up or you didn't just make sure that the calendar date was met, um, but you did a tremendous amount of work. And I think it's, it's helpful to, to help, your, help your audience understand that. Got a question? Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the comment was about the length of the narrative and what's appropriate for the length of the narrative. And I think that really kind of is a, a discipline sort of thing. Although I would, I, I would, I would try to be concise. Um, the narrative for me is pretty short and, but the narrative also cross references for me. So I, I mean, a little type A too. I mean, I know we've talked about this. But for me, the, the sections there, you know, I have a section tab for teaching and for advising. I have a section tab for scholarship. I have a section tab for, for service. I have a section tab for um, my student evaluations. I decided to put student evaluations in here. And so the narrative is pretty concise. And the letters of recommendation and the key flow documents and all of that, those are in here. If someone wants to go from the narrative and take a look at the big, long, detailed story behind that, that's fine. They can do that. That's in here. And in some cases, as I, as I mentioned, I like to use the divider pages between sections um, to kind of like have a little mini narrative as well or a little mini narrative kind of a table of contents or whatever to help someone understand. You know, because like... Um, in doing curriculum development and uh, making changes in courses, I'm going to have examples of syllabi in there. And in some cases, I'll have examples of syllabi that I changed. Well, I don't want to just have, you know, two, two copies of, of syllabi for the same course and just assume the audience is going to, the reader's going to understand why there are two versions in there. You know, so I, I'm, probably want to detail somewhere these were the significant changes that I made in the course and it's represented in going looking at the first syllabus and then looking at the second. Um, you know, the thing about student evaluations, and, and I think it's important to show how you respond to students and how you improve your courses. I had a situ I've taught a media history course before, and it's a lot of information. And so I had a complaint that I had uh, too many tests from in the student evaluation. So my response was to have fewer tests, but I had more content. Then I had a complaint by the next class, too few tests, too much content. And so, so but, but, I, but I showed how I tried to address the students' needs. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is because history is a, is a lot. And so... You know, but I still think it's important that we show that we're being responsive to students and uh, and that we show when we're making changes from one thing to another, that we're making that clear for for the reader. Don't just assume, throw a bunch of stuff in and, 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 and assume they're going to get it. Um, th this this last year, how many portfolios were reviewed at the University of 23? Was it, oh, 18. Okay, eighteen. I, I know. I know. It's been as many as as twenty three or more in a year, 
you have a you have a university level committee that um, has to those portfolios cannot leave the academic affairs office. They have to go there to look at those portfolios. They have to block out time between their classes to go look at those portfolios. So think about the amount of work that goes into that. So they're trying to spend as much time with everybody's portfolio as they can, but time's limited. And they can only do that when the academic affairs office is open and yada, yada, yada. They're not taking the portfolio home to look at it at night. They cannot leave the academic affairs office. So um, I do think brevity is important, but I do think being able to put in good markers to help navigate the attention of the person reviewing the portfolio is critical. And uh, the more you do of that, the more helpful it is for everyone. Yeah. Right. And 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 so again, you know, helping helping the person understand, you know, if that's what you, if that's what your chair wants, that's what you do. Right? But then that needs to be so if, if I'm going to write a brief narrative and I'm going to format it a certain way for my chair, that's fine, but that needs to be really evident to the next person who's going to review this, because as we've said, no two portfolios are going to look exactly the same. I would even argue within the same discipline, you're going to see a lot of variance. structure it differently um and you know a, a, one more thing that i would say uh, this may feel a little late for most people um but i would find the simplest way to organize your materials and for me that was to have a, a folder every year i had a folder filed to the front if i got a letter if i got an email if i got anything that i thought might be important i i threw it into the folder did my evaluation with my chair my chair gave me the evaluation that went in the folder and that was that academic year and that's filed away. And so um, the way I organized my portfolio was by the, by the three key areas, but within those three key areas, I organized them chronologically so that the reader could see progression. Um, and that worked for me. That's personality. That worked for me. That was how I, I kind of laid it out. Um, but we, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot of variance, but I, wh whatever structure you use, what I would suggest to you is uh, whatever pattern or structure you use that's laid out initially, follow it all the way through. Please don't bounce around and kind of do a different thing every year or whatever, um, because then your reader doesn't know what to expect when they go from one section to another. Do we have um, any other questions? We're right at two o'clock. And so uh, I, would, I would offer that if you have a question for me, you can email me. Would, would we be okay as a, as a group? If you have questions for us, just email us and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. But remember, your chair sets the tone and theme. So that's the most important person to ask questions of. <laughs>